Good morning. So we have a, a group of united disciples and a gathering of Jews ready for the Harvest Festival. And this is the setting of today's reading from Acts 2, verses 1 to 21. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Cappadocia Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then P Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we anticipate we're praying something that you delight in. Have your way in us. Shape and mould us into the character of Christ. Help us heed the words of Jesus when he says, be careful how you listen. Help us to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for the reading. When I saw those names in there, I thought, <laughs> my advice to anybody reading any funny names out of the Bible is just pronounce it with confidence. And even if somebody thinks it should be pronounced the other way, they'll be intimidated into thinking that, it's, that they're wrong. Just go for it. So Pentecost. I wonder how many Pentecost services we've all sat through. And I wonder which ones made any difference. <laughs> so Jesus, words of spirit and life. And Pentecost is all about words. The word. The gifts of being able to speak in a different language, but words. Hearing the Father, the wonders of God. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Because nothing's changed since that day. New deal. 
New Covenant. Old Testament now serves to explain. All the Old Testament folks wanted to know something that's not revealed in it. It says the prophets longed, kings longed to look into these things. Even angels, and they're revealed into the New Testament. Who God really is and what he's up to, the fulfillment of all of it, took his people by surprise. So even the folk in the Old Testament didn't really have a clue because they would have probably been taken by surprise too. Maybe we're still yet to be taken by surprise so that we understand what Jesus means when he says, on that day, you will understand. You'll know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me and I'm in you. Mysterious, only know through the spirit within inside going, Abba, Father, I know what that means, but I can't explain it to anyone. So let's see if some of that can work today. <laughs> Words of spirit and life. Flesh counts for nothing. The words I speak to you, Jesus said, are spirit and life. The words that the Holy Spirit speaks are spirit and life. The words that we speak are meant to be spirit and life. And we're capable of that. We're capable of bringing spirit and life into each other's lives through the words we speak and into the world out there. Because Jesus said, the words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And we'll see in a while that the spirit only tells, speaks what he already knows. It's the wonderful Trinity at work. One God, yet three. So here's the text. And I just want to zoom in on the Old Testament bit. Declaring the wonders of God. That's the line that is written down in chapter 2 of Acts, that everybody hearing what was going on or saying, what, what's this all about? We're hearing the de declaration of the wonders of God in our own language. So that's what that was happening in the speaking of tongues, declaring the wonders of God. Gospel. It's about communication. The Spirit poured out at that time so that people can declare the wonders of God clearly. That's what we can do. <laughs> and it's to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, which you wouldn't really understand if you didn't know the fulfillment of it on Pentecost. Because let's face it, it was full of people who were the people of God and they didn't understand what was happening. Note that well. Easy for us not to understand what the scriptures are really saying. They had God in front of them for three years, interpreting the Old Testament in a way they didn't agree with, and they killed him on our behalf. Because we would have killed him too. Why? Because he needed to take all the dross of the human race upon himself to extinguish it and deal with it. So in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on a few people. Some of your sons will speak, but not the women. They'll prophesy. Your young men won't be able to do anything because they're too green. And only the older men will let the good stuff be done. And see visions. Your old men will just chill. Even on my servants, only men. And the particular men I like particularly that are Holy enough, I will pour out my spirit in those days and some will prophesy. That's made the point, isn't it? That has made the point. Everyone. There is no discrimination here at all about this oracle of the Lord coming out of human beings' mouths. Not age, not gender, and we can go on, not economic background, not ethnic background. Everyone, you, me, Everybody calls on the name of the Lord. All people, that's brand new. That's why it was called the mystery made known in the New Testament that people long to look into because the Jewish race up to this point thought that they were special, didn't realize that they were the blessing to the human race, that something had to be done and it was going to take place through a particular race of people. Okay? The closer God gets to people that aren't <laughs> holy, the more of that unholiness comes out. 
So, so God decides to make a, a race and get as close as he can to them and bless them as much as he can. So it brings the worst of humanity out of them to the point at which he says, you're worse than all the other nations around you. They don't even do what you do, particularly give up your God for a different God. They don't give up their gods. It's not intuitive, is it? But all people, this is it. This is the mystery made known. And boy, are we a race that's still full of prejudice. Oh boy, are we not a church that still has division. How on earth can we fulfill Jesus' prayer? May they be one, Father, as we are one, I and you and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity so the world knows that you have sent me. How much prejudice is there in me that needs to be dealt with? And in you. So that the world, until that's dealt with, the world will then know that Christ has been sent. It's, it's awesome, isn't it? And yet we can. We're meant to. We're meant to. So let's just move on and keep with this declaring the wonders of God. And I just want to show you, this is what happens at the end of the sermon that follows that account. Basically, Peter stands up, filled with the Spirit, and says, look, this guy, Jesus that you killed, hand over to be killed, it was all a plan, he is the Messiah. And he preaches this sermon, and those who are listening are cut to the heart. They say, what do we do now? And he says this, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, why doesn't it say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Just a little one thrown in there. <laughs> every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But you, if you stay the same, something's wrong. Yeah? Because the Holy Spirit can't be sort of this awesome presence of God being poured into the human being in a new way that's never happened before, maybe with Jesus when he was baptized, to anoint, to be able to, as I was sent, so I'm sending you, it's, it's got to make a difference in your life, isn't it? You've got to think and see differently. It's, it can't be some concept, some abstract concept, some theological confession that makes no difference in a person's life or in the life of a Christian community. And it goes on, the promise is for you and your children and for all those in Lyme Regis as well, because they're far off. <laughs> we are far away. We're not far towards the utter ends of the earth. There's a little bit, there's a load of Atlantic Ocean going out there, but maybe Greenland and Iceland. We're, we're on the edge in this direction. All whom the Lord our God will call. That's interesting. Calling on the name of the Lord, the Lord calling us. Seems to be some sort of symbiotic thing going on there. So, yeah, declaring the word of God. Repent. Here's the new information. So, turn your life around. The way you think, the way you speak, your aspirations, your expectations, so it conforms to the new information. And the Holy Spirit will empower you to live the life that way. That's what repent means, turning around. Going in a different direction, one that is life in all of its fullness, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, fruit that will last, as we're told in John 15. So declaring the wonders of God. So I just want to pick up on that just to emphasize that it's this idea of communication, This because we can so often get lost in the idea of the Holy Spirit doing a sort of a power thing, so there's some supernatural thing happening. Well, in actual fact, every human being that's you know called on the name of the Jesus, Jesus is meant to be doing something supernatural just by loving their enemy. That is like way up the scale from healing and you know gift words of knowledge, because a human being that has gone from hating and wanting to kill an enemy to loving and blessing, that's miracle. And it can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. So 
let's just work on this and see like Jesus. And I thought, John 16 is good. Um, he says this to his disciples just before he's about to depart. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus had more to say. He didn't have time. He says they couldn't even cope with it. So the Holy Spirit is going to do that job. Okay? He will not speak on his own. See, we've got this speaking thing. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, if you want to say, well, this was just for his 12 disciples because they're special. Well, the Great Commission says, go into all the world and teach them everything I've taught you. So it's like for everyone. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Pentecost was the Holy Spirit receiving from Jesus and making known to that crowd. And by implication to us lot here this morning, because we read it again. Do you see that? The Holy Spirit is the voice of Christ. The voice of Christ is the voice of the Father. They never say anything different from one another. Hallelujah. We do. <laughs> <laughs> we say all sorts of things different from one another in the name of Jesus that contradict. That would make sense, does it? Are we in the spirit or not? So what's it going to say? All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Holy Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Make known to us here this morning, you yesterday, tomorrow. This is like totally applicational, isn't it? It's not like some theoretical thing. It's pretty simple and straightforward. So I just want to make that jump now to Jesus going on. We're going to John 10, shepherd. The sheep calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You know, in the Far East, you don't get a dog to nip them up on the back legs or anything. You go out in front and they follow the voice. The shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? He goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. He goes on to talk about the robber only comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I might come, they might have life in all of its fullness. It says that the sheep can recognize the, the robber's voice, the thief's voice, and they don't follow. Why? Because there is tons of voices coming your way. As a sheep of Christ, I was going to say the trick is, it's not a trick, is it? It's learning to discern the right voice in amongst all of them. And the enemy comes as an angel of light, not darkness. It's discerning. What, what, what would it sound like? Jesus is gentle and humble in heart. So the Holy Spirit must be. Whoa, the Father must be as well, because they haven't got any difference in character. Does that look like the God that the Christian church has put forth for 2,000 years? Gentle and humble of heart? Or they split the Trinity up so that one conforms to what you expect from that idea of authority and this one, the other one. It just splits the, the folk who, who, who worked out this idea of the Trinity. You know, they would be horrified at some of the ideas that have accumulated um, that basically divide up the Trinity into three distinct and very different characters. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I'm religious. <laughs> and by, by implication, wherever visitors come from. I must bring them also. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. Same. We're doing the same as they did on Pentecost Day. Right now. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. How's that going? Are we hearing Jesus' voice? Does there need to be a global massive reformation in his body? Because we keep on validating our differences. We want to hold on to our precious differences at the expense of our love and devotion and affection for one another. So let's just move on. Declaring the wonder of God. This is the wonder of God. We would declare it and understand it. It's not rocket science.
declaring the wonders of God. I reckon if every Christian throughout the last 2,000 years managed to nail this one, I know May nailed this one out of Ephesians, we'd have a, what a witness. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't say it. Oh, but I'm speaking the truth in love. Well, we'll work that one out if you really want to test it using the litmus of love. Because it might reveal you have no idea what the love of God is. You have an opinion you want to give rather than an idea you want to offer. How many of us do that? We have opinions that we give that we desire to be conformed to rather than same thing but a different attitude. We have an idea of thought that we humbly offer for consideration. They're massively different, aren't they? It's the same thing, different attitude. Whether it's over the songs in the morning, whether it's over how things are run in church, whether it's over how the chairs are out, whether it's over what's going on in line with the council, whatever it might be. Or do we have an idea of thought that we offer so that it might benefit those who listen and build things up? Or is it an opinion that we think if it's conformed to, things will go better? That's the shocker for me. So what does it go on to say? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Oh my goodness, gentle and humble of heart. You and me have the capacity to grieve the Spirit of God that has been poured out on humanity to allow life in all of its fullness to come, first and foremost, personally, but then use us to bring that to others. We can grieve God. We know what to be grieved means. This isn't offend. <clears throat> I'm offended. This is... <sighs> How many times have I already done that today? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Thessalonians say, don't quench the Spirit. Dear me, I have the capacity to quench the creator of the universe in my life and what he wants to do to me and through me. I have the power to quench it. That implies he's not going to force it on me. Oh, dear me, how many times have I done that? Does it say anything about retribution from that and punishment because I've dishonored? No. For now, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life has enabled us to be freed from the law. We can quench and grieve this Holy Spirit that we think is so powerful that he just bulldozes through stuff and gets the Lord's will done. That's very human thinking about authority and power, isn't it? If it's not going to go your way, you just pick up a bigger stick until it does. That's not what God's like. He's humbled himself. Didn't think being God was something to wield, but made himself nothing. Kenosis, emptied himself, taking on the, 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 the role of a, of a servant, even to life being extinguished on the cross. Which means that's what God's like. I've said it before. He's not a master, he's the servant. And yet he's in charge. And we've put him on the master's throne with a big stick. And <laughs> declaring the wonders of God, that's what we've told people about God. If you don't sort yourself out, you'll get the stick. This, this, this just doesn't seem right with the character of God. Maybe it's because we haven't actually f received that gentleness ourselves and understood it. That if we're to be like the Spirit, that's how we present ourselves to others. So, just to finish, how do I know whether I'm speaking in love or not? Because my whole life is characterized in step with the spirit when my mind 
set on the things of the spirit rather than the flesh, Romans 8, is by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Don't say anything. Don't think you're declaring the wonders of God, Chris, unless it is characterized by those things. Humility, gentleness, self-control. And if we go back to that idea of enemy, if I'm saying something that is not good for building up the other according to their need, it's because if I really owned up to it, I have little or no real affection for them. And you know that by just looking at the people that you do have affection for. And consider your stance and what you might say and how you would say it to them compared to the person that you just about to say something and do something. Is it, is it really going to achieve anything? Is it a, a good idea that actually will produce life in all of its fullness? Or is it an opinion so things conform to the way you think things ought to be? I keep saying you, this is me. <laughs> and I get the chance to blast it off at the front here. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others. Do you think that's what was happening on Pentecost? The stuff coming out of the mouth was good for building up others. It was an authentic, unbridled, unadulterated, declaring the wonders of God so that it was life in all of its fullness. You have the capacity to do that in Christ, and so do I. We also see it look likewise have the capacity to do it the other way, which is why I might draw attention back to the beginning of the service and those three characters, the one we want to project, the one that we know but we don't want anybody to really know about and get too close to, maybe those closest to us, and then the third one, which we don't really appreciate because it's the truth about who we are in Christ. That is the one which the Holy Spirit from dawn till dusk and in between is trying to draw out of us, to train us. And the one where it goes on to talk about bearing with one another in love, forgiving each other as Christ forgave you. It's because somebody might not be as far down the road in this process as others. And they aren't saying things that are that good for building up others. And we just give them a bit of elbow room and we cherish them and love them and we just help them. The trouble comes when they don't seem to want to change, and that's what problems within churches are, grumbling and complaining about things which are not life in all of its fullness. They're about protocols and conventions and procedures within an institution and how it ought to be done, but the next church doesn't think it ought to be done that way. And yet, at the same time, that energy can be spent speaking words of spirit and life. Oh my goodness, how much time have I wasted not bearing fruit that will last, but some gone off horrible rotten fruit that re won't really benefit anybody or nourish them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is what was poured into human beings on the day of Pentecost and has been ever since. It's the litmus test for us to, to self-control ourselves <laughs> so that we can actually only say what the Father has said to the Son, that the Son has said to the Spirit, that we can only give what the Father's given to the Son and the Son is given to the Spirit so that it's all given to us that we might pass it on. And we all have the capacity to do it. It's not about Bible knowledge. It's about where your heart's at. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you.